So to start with, uh, we thought we would share some information about uh, use of corn silage and uh, like we've done earlier, Dirk Birkin, who's a PhD student and also manages the feedlot here, is going to be presenting some of his research and I'm going to try and set him up uh, as well and share some of the reasons why that we think this is important. So what I'm going to try and talk about is why would you be thinking about corn silage and why do we want to revisit this topic? Uh, is feeding it, uh, some of the historical information on feeding it and then how is it different today, particularly as it relates to the big change that Terry talked about, which was the use of it with some of these byproducts and uh, updating those economics and then make some conclusions because everything's different today than what it was before. So relative to corn and dry stover, you retain the solubles in the plant. And uh, that's exactly what Terry discussed. And, uh, and Dirk even has some data that shows that very clearly uh, that there's a time to harvest corn silage that maximizes the retention of those good things that are still in that plant, uh, the plant part outside of the grain. Uh, when you harvest corn silage, you get high moisture corn. What might be more important in the future is you obviously have inventory, that's good and bad. Uh, having inventory uh, can be good if it's hard to find and it's bad if you have to pay for that inventory over the year. Uh, but somebody's going to pay for, for inventory throughout the year. We believe that this fits in very, uh, in these integrated uh, feedlot crop operations. And uh, that's not all bad for this part of the country. And doesn't hurt my feelings if this fits well for a 5,000 head feedlot over a 105,000 head feedlot. Um, Historically, uh, silage made more sense when we had high grain prices, and so we want to go through that with you. Now, we're going to show you some economics later uh, to justify this, or Dirk will, but just in concept, if corn is $250 a dry ton, which equates to $6 a bushel, uh, based on my math, $6 bushel corn is $252 per dry ton. So $250 dry ton uh, corn, if you, and, and again, Dirk will mention this, but eight and a half times corn price or eight and a half times six, silage is $51 per ton as is. At 35% dry matter, that equates to just under $150 a ton of dry matter for silage. So if corn's $250 and silage is $150 and silage is half grain, half residue, the residue is costing about $50. And uh, we think that might have more value than that to be fed. So that's part of why we think this issue should be revisited. And uh, we can debate all of these economics. Whenever we do economics, I know that's a debatable uh, issue. But you can do it in the way you want, but we still believe it's going to be very competitive. OK, this isn't a new concept. It's kind of ironic that the two topics we're going to talk about today, a lot of them are researched. I guess I'm happy to say this. There was a time when I wasn't happy to say this, but almost all this was researched about the time I was born. Uh, now that, that's starting to be more appealing. That Actually, I was born then. I'm not that old. Point is, is that we revisit a lot of things, and that, that's very difficult for some young people like me to always keep in mind. Uh, a lot of these things that make sense today, frankly, were researched long before my time. And we got to remember how that work was done and build on how that work was done, not just repeat what was done. This is a summary of Goodrich from Minnesota. Uh, there's a lot of elevated feeding of corn silage work done in the, in the 60s and 70s. Fact, you know, uh, I don't remember this. Actually, this isn't true. I do remember this because that's how we were feeding cattle. You would put cattle on corn silage and take about a year and then they'd be finished. That's how we did it when I was a kid. Well, this work summarized 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, or 80 percent corn silage in the diet, obviously the remainder being grain. And these data are obviously different than today, but gains of two and a half that gradually decrease down to about two. But not zero out here at, at high levels of silage. 
intakes, you can see, not much impact. And conversions get poor as you increase silage in the diet. That's not uh, going to be different than what you see today. Feed the gain is poor as you increase silage levels. The question is, is whether that depression in feed conversion or that increase in feed conversion is still profitable depending upon how you price the silage. So in this example from Goodrich from 1974, he used corn price of 350, which I found inter interesting, uh, and silage price of 26.45 on a 32% dry matter silage. And these were the profits from that, that Minnesota Feeders Day report that were reported of 25. And as you increase silage, you actually made more money uh, than not feeding as much silage. And I think that's what people have led. Back in that day, my understanding was 350 corn was expensive. And uh, that was what led to a lot of that work. Uh, I'd like to say because we were so, had such forethought, about 10 years ago, I actually worked on feeding extra higher levels of corn silage as part of my graduate school work. Had nothing to do with this issue today. It was because we were, uh, it was Terry's, I, we were trying to figure out a way to increase uh, organic matter on the pen surface. It was Terry's idea to use corn silage to do that because it's less digestible, yet it's generally economical or is one of the more economical ways to do that. So that was his idea to use silage. Uh, so this was work I actually did in school and organic matter digestibilities are, are, were, were not influenced going from 15 to 45% corn silage in the diet. And this is in a grain-based diet. pH was increased in the rumen. We did actually three experiments. <clears throat> Uh, the first one was with yearlings. Again, all these treatments are 15, 30, or 45 percent corn silage. Gain decreased quadratically. This is prob could be due to negative associative effects of grain versus forage. It's about the time you see that. Uh, conversions uh, were quadratic as well, which supports that. So uh, the point is, is that at least for these yearlings, the 45 didn't look too bad, especially relative to 30. Carcass characteristics, they were a little bit leaner, but marbling didn't seem to be influenced. Calf feds, that same time frame, uh, fed through the winter months, winter, spring. Gains decreased linearly for the calf feds. Conversions increased linearly. Uh, no, not a big impact, although there was a depression in, in marbling and a decrease in fat depth. So calf fed yearling response may be different. If you look on the, cat, on the yearlings, well, no, on the calf feds, uh, the response looks a little different. It's linear in the calf feds and was quadratic in the yearlings. So this was a second set of yearlings. Uh, and again, conversions uh, got poorer as we increased silage and uh, about the same as the first trial. If you combine all three experiments, which might be the most powerful, uh, it still came out to be a quadratic depression and gain and a quadratic uh, increase in feed conversion. But again, a conversion of seven versus six three could be economical. Now, just for fun's sake, I did keep the economics that we had done back in 2000, just because I thought it was intriguing. <clears throat> Has nothing to do with what you're going to see today, so it's not useful to look at. But I thought it was interesting. This is so that's why I put old silage economics. Probably don't remember diet costs in the 70s per dry ton, uh, cost of gains in the 40s and break-evens in the, in the 60s, and that was 10, 12 years ago. Uh, so things have changed dramatically in the last 10 or 12. This reiterates what Terry said. Now, in this case, in diets where corn silage replaced corn at 15, 30, and 45 percent inclusion, the, 50, the 30 and 45 percent inclusion did not compete or outcompete the 15 percent inclusion, but it also didn't fall apart. Now, if you fed them the same weight, it helped a little bit, but not dramatically. That was with yearlings. With calf feds, not much different. Again, that was old data. The economics don't apply today. But point is, is that it may or may not be economical when you just look at corn silage replacing grain. So why, uh, why, are, we, why are we revisiting this issue now? Well, corn price as Terry alluded to, is higher, and uh, 
Don't know what that'll be in the future, but we thought regardless, it's going to go up and down in the future, and so we might as well do this work to be prepared. Lots of interest, as evidence, we think, from the turnout today, and how do we use more residue. I think Terry and, and Steve this morning did a good job of discussing why we think this residue is going to become more important to use. And, uh, and so we thought, well, instead of using dry stocks that, that lose the solubles, maybe we ought to retain those and use silage. And then how does this fit in today's type of diets with the distiller's grains and, and the byproducts that are available? We had some evidence that there was a real good synergy between feeding silage and byproducts. And, and so based on that little bit of evidence, we thought this was critical to explore more. So Dirk's going to share that exploration with you. My name is Dirk Birkin. I'm a PhD student under uh, Galen and Terry. And uh, like he said, my research deals with corn silage. Um, this feedlot experiment, we utilized 36 pens, um, six treatments, six replications, um, 324 calf fed steers. Uh, these cattle were fed for 173 days and harvested in early May. As far as treatment design, we have uh, four treatments with 40% distiller's grains, uh, modified distiller's grains with solubles. And then we have either uh, corn silage inclusion at 15, 30, 45, or 55%. Um, we also added uh, two more treatments here. One with 45% corn silage and no modified distiller's grains. That way we can make a pairwise comparison uh, between the 45% corn silage inclusion treatments. And then we also have another treatment uh, with 30% corn silage and 65% modified distiller's grains, uh, once again to make a pairwise comparison uh, to the 30-40 treatment. So as far as feedlot performance, um, as you can see, as we increased corn silage inclusion level, uh, we found a linear decrease in final body weight and average daily gain. With the cattle at with the cattle feed getting fed 15% uh, corn silage, having about a 90 pound advantage in final live weight uh, versus the 55% corn silage inclusion cattle. Uh, dry matter intakes were also linearly decre decreased as corn silage inclusion increased. Um, but once you look at feed to gains, uh, you still see pretty good feed conversions at this 55% corn silage level. Uh, if you look down at this graph here, we see depressions in, in feed conversions um, at that 55% level of about 8%. If you go back to that previous research that Galen was just talking about, uh, most notably the Goodrich data, um, at 50%, that depression in feed conversion was around uh, 15%. Um, so the depression in feed conversion is not near as much in these diets with distillers grains. Um, so there's some synergy there. Looking at carcass characteristics, um, we did see a linear decrease in percent As corn silage was increased in the diet, uh, no effect on marbling score. Um, and we did see a linear decrease in fat thickness as corn silage was increased. Now for the two pairwise comparisons. Uh, first for the cattle getting fed 45% corn silage. Um, we found a 35 pound advantage in final live weight uh, for cattle that were fed distillers grains with 45% corn silage. Um, not much difference in dry matter intakes. Uh, feed to gain, we also saw an advantage for the cattle fed distillers grains uh, by about, what is that, 5% or so. Um, dressing percent was Similar, marbling score similar, fat thickness similar. Uh, for the pairwise comparison of the cattle uh, feed, getting fed 30% corn silage diets uh, with either 40% modified or 65% modified, uh, we saw that uh, 
Final body weights and average daily gain was better for the cattle uh, at the lower level of distillers grains at 40%. Um, so we're looking like maybe 65 was a little too much of distillers grains in these diets. Um, dry matter intakes was also improved for cattle, fed 40% instead of 65% modified distillers grains. Uh, feed to gain, um, not much difference, not, st not statistically different um, there. Dressing percent and carcass characteristics uh, were not statistically different. So with that performance data um, and the positives out of that, we decided to put some economic assumptions to this data and uh, see what this looked like on a profit per head or cost of gain basis. Um, we priced corn at 350, 5, and 650 per bushel. Uh, corn silage was then priced at either 8, 8.5, or 9 times the price of corn. Um, like Galen mentioned, you know, like... Uh, the old rule of thumb was 10 times the price of corn for corn silage. So corn si if corn was 350, corn silage would be $35. Um, and we think this 8.5 is really a, a good number. Um, using Nebraska custom rates of harvesting for corn, corn silage, and then using the opportunity cost of the corn grain, um, we found out that corn silage should be priced right around 8.6 times the price of corn at 350 a bushel, 8.4 times the price of corn at five bush, five dollars a bushel, and 8.2 8 times the price of corn at 650. Uh, other economic assumptions. Uh, so we can standardize these uh, values. We made the 1540 control cattle break even, and we did this by uh, varying cattle purchase cost. Uh, for every price combination. Due to uh, the effect of differing, differing selling weight on the economic uh, advantages uh, between treatments, we decided to take all these cattle, the 1,375 pounds, and, adjust, and then adjusted days uh, back. So we fed those cattle, those higher uh, silage diet cattle, longer to get, to get them to 1,375 pounds. Uh, cattle sales were $1,667. Uh, interest we charged 7.5 for both feed and cattle. Uh, ingredient price otherwise modified we did charge at 90% the price of corn. Uh, supplement equal to corn. Uh, we did charge a shrink at 1% for corn and supplement. 5% for modified distillers and 10% for corn silage. Uh, yardage 45 cents. Medicine $20.00 and we did include a death loss. So first looking at uh, 350 corn and 8.5 times uh, for corn silage, we do see a linear improvement in profit per head um, as corn silage is increased with the most improvement in profit per head seen at 45% at dietary inclusion of corn silage. And that's right around $18 to the 1540 control cattle. Uh, if you look at cost of gains, a uh, similar response, uh, but about a $3 per hundred weight cost of gain advantage uh, for those higher levels of corn silage cattle. Now we jump that corn price to $5 a bushel. Um, same linear response, silage has increased, uh, but we jumped that profit up to right around uh, $27, $28 per head relative to the 1540 control cattle. Um, and, this 15, and the 55% inclusion cattle look even better. Uh, they're starting to increase uh, profit per head relative to the rest of the treatments. Uh, cost of gain, uh, now we see an advantage of somewhere around uh, $4 per hundred weight for these higher levels of silage. Jacking corn up to 650, uh, once again linear response, but now we see profit per head uh, jump all the way up close to $40 per head advantage compared to the 1540 control cattle um, with the most optimal corn silage inclusion up there around 55%. Cost gain advantage now is right around $6. Uh, 
for those higher levels of corn silage inclusion. Now for the pairwise, uh, cattle fed 45% corn silage with or without 40% modified distillers grains. Um, and then that corn price of, of 350, five and 650. Um, I think this graph really shows the synergy we are seeing with corn silage and uh, distillers grains. Um, the cattle fed 45% corn silage with 40% distillers all made a profit relative to the control diet. Um, somewhere between 20 and, and $40. You look at the cattle that didn't got, did not get any modified in their diets, um, all these cattle lost money relative to control, somewhere around $12. Um, up there, 650 corn, we see a, a profit per head advantage of somewhere around $50 uh, by adding modified into that diet. Uh, cost of gain, similar response, uh, $7 a hundred weight out there at 650 corn. Now for the cattle fed 30% corn silage diets, either with 40% modified distillers grains or 60. Um, we see no statistical difference in, in profit per head at any price level. Um, however, there is numerical advantages uh, for the cattle fed 40% distillers grains instead of 65. Uh, cost of gain as well. Um, numerical advantages for the 40% uh, distillers cattle versus the 65%. Uh, but no statistical advantages. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit and, and talk about some more uh, corn silage, corn residue research that we are doing. Um, before it gets to the feedlot, you could say, uh, but while it's still in, in the field, um, we are doing some corn silage, corn plant plot research. Because um, we think corn silage production uh, needs to be produced so we get high yields, high quality, but also has the flexibility that we can not feed cattle, uh, harvest the grain, and with or without harvesting the dry residue. Um, we think this would allow farmer feeders uh, the most flexibility in terms of what they are going to do uh, with what the market dictates. So the objective of this experiment was to determine the effects of corn hybrid or season length uh, plant density and harvest timing on corn plant yield and quality. With this, uh, in conjunction with Dr. T Tom Hogemeyer and Hogemeyer Hybrids, um, we utilized a corn grain yield research plot near York, Nebraska. Um, in this study, we had 10 different hybrids in which we grouped into two groups of five. One group of five was a moderately early maturity uh, group somewhere around uh, 107 to 111 day corn and then another group of five hybrids which were uh, moderately late maturity corn uh, 112 to 117 day hybrids and then along with hybrids we had uh, three we had four planting densities um, times and then three reps of each combination one sample was five competitive corn stalks uh, in this field. And then uh, those five competitive, com five corn stalks were then separated into grain, cob, husk, and the remaining residue fractions. So this is a pic these are pictures of our uh, custom harvester crew. So like I said, we had three harvest times that we collected uh, corn plants. Uh, the first was September 1st. Um, these hybrids, these hybrid uh, total corn plant dry matter percentages was, were right around 34 to 38% uh, dry matter. Uh, I know we were cutting corn silage up here at Mead um, the day before, so it was right around corn silage time. Um, the second harvest was September 15th, um, a little drier, and then uh, the last harvest was September 29th, which would have been about a week before uh, combine grain harvest. Uh, so first we'll look at the effects of season length 
on uh, yield and quality characteristics. Like I said, we had five hybrids uh, that we grouped into moder moderately early maturity hybrids, uh, 107 to 111 day corn, and five hybrids that we grouped into moderately late, 112 to 117 day corn. So as you, if, as you look up here, uh, we see increases in grain yield and dry matter yield uh, with longer season corn, um, but a decrease in, in grain percentage of the total plant. If we look at residue NDF, um, that is everything but the grain, we see an increase in residue NDF and an increase in residue TDN, but due to the differences in grain percentage uh, going the other way, we see no difference in corn plant TDN um, between season length of hybrids. When we look at planting density, um, I'll back up a little bit. We, these planting densities was at 20,000, 26,000, 32,000, and 38,000 plants per acre. This was an irrigated, uh, good ground, York County, Nebraska cornfield. Um, so at those planting densities, we did see a quadratic response to grain and dry matter yields. Um, with higher levels of yield as we increased uh, planting density. Grain percentage was also a quadratic response, um, but really not a lot of difference, somewhere in that 54 to 55 uh, percent of the total plant uh, grain percentage. Residue NDF, as you can see, we had a linear response um, with higher residue NDF as we increased corn plant density. As far as TDN of that residue, we saw a linear decrease as we increased planting density. Um, overall, corn plant TDN, we did see a linear de depression as, as corn plant density increased, uh, but not, you know, we're, at, we're talking about half a percent of TDN. Now we get on to the harvest times. Um, like I said, that first harvest time was right around corn silage time. Uh, the second harvest was when plants were 45, 46% dry matter. And then the third would mimic uh, corn grain harvest. Um, as we prolonged harvest later into the season uh, from silage to corn grain harvest, we saw linear decreases in dry matter yield um, this is due to the residue um, losing its solubles. They're going off to the CO they're going off to the atmosphere of CO2. Um, that's just lost. So that's where we're getting uh, loss in yield. The grain's not going anywhere. That amount of grain is staying constant. But as you can see, uh, grain percent is, is actually increasing, and that is exactly why. That is because uh, once again we're losing those solubles. So our actual percentage of residue um, is going down. Residue NDF is linearly increased, as one would expect uh, with more maturity on corn. Residue TDN is linearly decreased as we get further into the harvest season. Uh, but corn plant TDN is actually increased because we have more grain percentage um, in that total corn plant. So if we do some calculations and get to TDN yield per acre, um, the yellow would be uh, TDN coming from grain. Uh, the green would be TDN coming from the residue. We see that total uh, TDN coming from the grain is staying relatively constant. Uh, we see a little bump here. Uh, but these right here, the grain's not going anywhere. It's this residue that's, that's uh, getting lost um, that's causing a, a very severe depression in, in TDN yield um, of around 15%. So we're harvesting 15% less TDN per acre. If you want to put that on a dollar figure, I just used $5 a bushel corn, uh, calculated that back to a, a TDN value 
we're losing about $310 per acre due to loss in TDN harvested. Um, now that is a gross value that's not taking into account uh, differences in harvesting cost, uh, but I think that is a, a very large dollar figure that we need to think about. So with this data, corn silage and really corn plant production depends on decisions, uh, hybrid and season length, planting density and harvest timing. Uh, with this harvest timing having a, a huge impact uh, on what we get out of that uh, corn plant production. And, and the big question is, do we harvest this corn field as corn silage or do we go to corn grain and stover? I've never seen it, but. <laughs> you want it? Okay. So uh, corn silage looks to be competitive. Um, yes, it increases feed to gain slightly, uh, but it is not near as uh, pronounced as what we've seen in the 1970s with straight corn-based diets. Um, corn silage looks better as, co as corn grain is increased. Um, like we said before, it works better with wet distillers or modified distillers compared to the historical data that we have seen. Um, somewhere in that 45, 45% corn silage with 40% distillers grains uh, seems to be optimal um, at some of our lower priced corn. Um, and we get good uh, performance from that, those diets. And it, Corn silage does seem to be extremely economical at 8.5 times the corn price. Um, that's a big factor in here is, is what we price corn silage at. We do this fits into an integrated crop livestock operation. Uh, we can recycle manure back onto those corn silage acres uh, for no nutrient concerns. Um, we do believe this fits into farmer feeder uh, type operations, silage on their own acres and then manure back on there. However, if, if we do not have enough land, uh, maybe dry stocks and grain is a better fit. With that, we'll take questions.